He is an esteemed member of UCLA basketball immortality. You know him as Mitchell Butler. And he joins us on the podcast. I'm Brian Fenley. I am on Twitter at Brian Fenley. Mitchell, thanks for doing this from an esteemed Bruin to an NBA career to now a sports agent. I'm sure your life has taken you in ways these last couple of weeks and months that you did not see happening, nor did any of us. Brian, thanks for having me on, first of all. And yes, um, you know, with COVID-19 and, you know, everything that's happened over the last, um, you know, five, six months, um, it has been eye-opening for us all. Um, you know, makes us look at, you know, mortality, I think, in a different way. Um, you know, I think that we take a lot of things for granted. And, uh, you know, this is Mother Nature's way of kind of shaking us a little bit and asking us to, you know, pay attention, pay attention to everything around, everything that she's given us, and to be thankful for it. So you've obviously been a sports agent for many years. And with all that's taken place, with the postponement of the NBA and all the fallout from of that, from that, and then now the league is trying to find ways to restart or resume the season, and now you've got the NCAA and the NBA indefinitely postponing the July 3rd early entry withdraw date for draft prospects. So when you're meeting with guys right now and talking to your clients, Mitchell, what are those conversations like? Because there's still a lot to be decided here in the next couple of weeks, and hopefully we can get some basketball again soon. Well, there are a couple of different conversations that are going on. Um, you're having one with the veterans, um, and, and those guys are the revenue drivers for the NBA, the guys that are currently there. And the NBA is primarily focused in on that. How do they get to, to saving the you know, 16 to 20 games that were left in the, in the regular season, which probably equates to somewhere around a billion dollars in revenue for the NBA? Um, you know, certainly on the TV contract side, and then you have, you know, your gate receipts, and then you have your concession and your parking and all of those things. So um, they're trying to figure out that aspect of it first. They want to make sure that they're moving properly. I've had some conversations with people in front offices, some people in the league office, some people on the MBPA side, and um, all of the conversations have been around, you know, um, how do they get the revenue drivers back in a safe manner? They don't want to rush this process. Um, and then expose players and their families to, you know, this, this horrific disease. So they're being very cautious and, and um, just making sure that they're crossing their T's and they're dotting their I's before they run the players back out to play those games. Now, on the flip side of it, you have the draft. The draft is a non-revenue driver for the league. It's probably something that they're not focused on as much. Um, I wouldn't say that they're not focused on at all, but not as much because – it isn't a revenue driver. You know, they have to figure out how do they save these games? How do they save this money? That process will unfold after they make a decision on the season, whether they play games and finish out a regular season or they cancel the season in totality. So the, the, the league has, you know, there are two different things when I'm talking to a potential client and a client. You know, one is, is hey, stay ready. Make sure you're safe and you're healthy because they're going to do mass testing. And, you know, you'll have to go into quarantine. You won't be able to train with your teammates if you're positive. And then on the flip side of it with the, um, with the rookies, um, you know, they're starting to piece together now the puzzle on that side and give um, some of these players who are declaring that are, that are underclassmen the opportunity to go through a process that's going to um, not hurt them at the end of the day if they decide to pull out and go back to college. Yeah, because I'm wondering, and Mitchell Butler joins us, he was on UCLA, and every single year he was on the team, they made it to the NCAA tournament. You have a lot of guys that are trying to, to make it professionally and aren't going to get that face time with executives right now because there aren't the workouts with teams and that face-to-face -face and all of that. So you wonder how that affects the standing of those players and if they are better suited to wait a year if they still have some eligibility. But where you are right now and where we are, I, I would say, what are we, about two months since the NBA stopped? How confident are you in, in where the, the, the league has progressed in their grasp of what this COVID-19 you know, dilemma is and that, that they're better suited to get things running now that they've had some time to assess it and, and see a little bit more about what it does? 
Well, I think they're going to approach it a lot differently than you have your politicians approaching it. Um, I think a lot of people are worried about the economy and, and you know, uh, rightfully so. Um, there are going to be so many jobs that are going to be lost. People are going to be unemployed. The impact and the depth of this um, won't be felt for, you know, truly another, you know, 12 to 18, maybe 24 more months. Um, but the NBA, I think, is going to be very, very prudent in um, their decision to open back up and, and when to start games. I think they're going to listen to the World Health Organization. I think they're going to listen to the Center for Disease Control. I think they're going to listen to the top scientists. It won't be politicians that will push the NBA back onto the floor to start playing basketball games. Um, they're going to do this thing um, the right way. They've always done it the right way, being the first of the professional sports leagues to shut down. Um, you know, they have a fiduciary responsibility to, um, you know, their organizations, uh, the, the staff members, the players, their families, and that's most uh, prudent for them. Um, Adam Silver is, is an amazing commissioner, very smart, very forward thinking, um, but he's extremely calculated too, and he has some very smart people at his office that are giving advice and counsel to him, and um, like I said, I think they'll make the right choice and the right decision, and it'll be the best thing for the NBA. Mitchell Butler joins us, former UCLA Bruin. Mitchell, what do you think about the emergence of the G League? And now they've just poached an international player into their academy. You've seen a lot of five-star guys, a couple of them, even one that was intending to go to UCLA and Dacian Nix decide to opt to go the G League route. And obviously there's some compensation involved and, and players are going to be able to be paid right out, out of high school. How does this affect college basketball and the NCAA? It's going to have a pretty significant effect on um, the the uh, on college basketball for sure. Now, this is one team that's uh, being fielded this year for this particular purpose. Um, but certainly, I think um, the NBA has reserved the right to have deeper discussions with the NC2A on um, high school players being able to bypass uh, a year of mandatory college or, or a year of being removed from their high school graduating class uh, upon entering the NBA draft. Um, I think players are going to be allowed to do that right off the, right off the top now. And um, it's going to have a deep effect on how the NBA uh, and how the college landscape looks. Um, having a G League where kids can go and, and can be developed, um, it's, you know, it's important that I think that, um, you know, they go in, they learn how to be a professional, they're going to be required to, to do certain things that the normal G League players aren't required to do. Um, and it's going to, you know, lead to them being able to make a transition to the NBA a lot smoother and a lot better. It also seems like it's putting some pressure on the NCAA to make some tweaks to what they have done in the past as far as dealing with, with high-profile student athletes. And there's going to be, I would think, Mitchell, a tug of war going on between the G League, the NBA, and the NCAA. My final question for you as far as the whole agent game and all of that, what is it like to work with Toby Bailey? And, and, and how do you also look at what makes an agent good? What makes a, an agent a bad one? And how do agents at times try to take advantage of clients and, and how you steer away from that? Okay, uh, that's a great question. I'm going to answer that, but I want to go back to your previous point that you just finished. Sure. Because I thought it was a good point. The NC2A, if they're smart, can have strong legs to stand on to compete against the NBA G League and the NBA if they embrace their players being able to make money off of their image and their likeness. Sure. That is their um, that is their golden carrot, and they have to pursue that. If they don't pursue that then players are going to leave and they're going to take the money. But if you can come into college, you can brand yourself and you can make money away from the college basketball court or your name, image, and likeness, that, you know, it, it really does level the playing field a little bit for the NC2A. So they don't lose their brand. They make a billion dollars off of March Madness. They can't afford to have that not be as strong and as robust as it can possibly be. So, you know, if they're smart, they would embrace that and they would figure out a way to make that work for all collegiate players because it's to their advantage. Now, working with Toby has been fantastic. Um, you know, that's my little brother. Uh, he came into <laughs> UCLA years uh, after after I was there. And, um, you know, he played with Tyus Sedney, uh, Ed O'Bannon, uh, George Zedek. 
those guys were uh, freshmen when I was a junior and most of uh, our really good team, we made it to the Elite Eight. Uh, those guys were young guys on the team. And we like to say that we kind of groomed Tyus and, and Ed and George Zedek for that championship run. And, and they put together a magical season. They, they hung an 11th banner at UCLA. We're so proud of them. We're so happy for them. Um, and, um, you know, he's been, he's been a pleasure to work with. He's a hard worker. He's got a lot of great relationships. Um, his career took him through the NBA as well as a, a stellar and amazing international career. So um, we've been working together for the last six years, and it's been great. Um, we both approach the agent business um, like we wanted to be represented ourselves. We try to go over and beyond that level of service. Um, number one, you just got to have constant contact with your agent. Your agent has to be accessible. Number two, um, your agent should understand you as a basketball player, your game, who you are, and then try to find the right situation for you to develop and matriculate in. You see a lot of situations where a guy may get drafted really highly, and they're super excited on draft night, but two years later, they're out of the league. Uh, Anthony Bennett, Johnny Flynn, Xavier Henry, you can go down the list of guys that were a lot of picks that are, you know, maybe spent two or three years in the NBA and they're out. You ask those guys, would you go back six or seven, eight, 10, 15, 20 spots, but still be in the league? They'll tell you absolutely. Wow. So um, a lot of times agents just bypass that and it's all about getting the client drafted and leaving them and then trying to figure something else out uh, when it comes to that point later on in their careers. But we try to take our guys and grab their hands and walk them through the process all the way until they get to that second contract. Once you get to that second contract, that pretty much assures you that you know, you're going to be a mainstay in the league for a little while. Obviously, with your credibility and your pedigree as someone who's been in the league, that has to look finally on potential clients. And I love, Mitchell, that a little subtle credit for, for you as a player, how that actually helped out the guys win that title in 95. Hey, you know, I kind of groomed them. You know, I deserve a little bit of credit, too. I love that. I love that. Mitchell Butler is joining us. And one player who I love, we, we do a show together during basketball season, Tracy Murray, one of your teammates. And he was super excited that we got to have you on this podcast. And so I got to ask you, what was it like having Tracy as a roommate? As a roommate, super guy. Uh, we had <laughs> so much fun together. Uh, we, we knew each other since uh, we were 12 years old. We played on lots of teams uh, growing up. Um, and, you know, uh, both choosing UCLA, um, you know, we were both all state players. He was the state MVP. Uh, I was the runner up. Um, you know, he's one of the all time best. Uh, you know, I, I love the guy. That's my brother. Um, we talk several times a month still. Um, and it's, it's just like old times. Uh, you know, he's the best. Well, both of you are. And I was reading this article on you, Mitchell. I think it was in the LA Times where it chronicled your high school path and your love of learning and your love of psychology and, and psychoanalysis. And so now that you have had a, a good chunk of your life from a player to an agent and all of that, how would you psychoanalyze your life? And, and what would Freud say? Because I, I remember there's a quote from this article that said, you said, hey, I like <laughs> Freud. So what's Freud saying about your life at this point and what you've done? Oh, no, you're, you're taking me back on that. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I did. I, I loved psychology when I was a kid growing up. I took an independent study course uh, with the headmaster at my, at my high school, uh, a gentleman named Jim Asman, Dr. Jim Asman, let me uh, give him his proper credentials. And, um, you know, he's done a lot of work in the, in the psychology field, um, you know, with learning and, and um, with uh, humanitarian rights, with learning and things of that nature. So um, with me, you know, I, I've, I've used it. Um, it wasn't what I majored in at UCLA. I majored in communication studies at UCLA. Um, I switched uh, from a psych, pre-psych major to communications. Um, but I, I use it with my clients. Um, I try to, you know, get into their heads and let them know that, you know, uh, the game is 90% mental, 10% physical. I mean, everyone's got physical gifts and physical abilities. Um, you know, I give them examples of players that have tremendous physical gifts and psychologically, they may not be as strong as uh, some players that 
have very limited gifts but are strong psychologically. Now, I won't name the players that have great physical gifts that are weak psychologically, but I can point to a guy like Larry Bird, who was physically limited, but psychologically, he was just a rock. And, you know, he got the maximum out of his ability. You look at a guy like Kobe Bryant, um, God rest his soul, he was athletic and gifted, but he got every single ounce of ability and talent out of his body. Um, should, he have, should he have been as great as he is? You know, if you look at him, he was just like any other ordinary NBA player, but he had this psychological uh, grit about him that really allowed him to be able to maximize his full potential and his full talent. And most people don't do that. We hit that wall of uh, fear, that wall of, um, you know, a test or a challenge, and we take one step back and we exist right there in front of it. And, you know, the great ones, they hit it and they get to the other side and they realize their destiny. I always tell people on the other side of fear is your destiny. And what a career he had. And I know you know better, better than I that when he was 17, he was on UCLA's campus during the summer and showing out and, and showing up some much older, even star NBA guys that were working out at UCLA in the summer. Who's this 17-year-old guy? And why is he crossing me over and embarrassing me out on the court. But like you said, that's a testament to that, that mental fortitude and tenacity that he brought that made him so special. And kind of pivoting from there to your UCLA career, what game to this day, Mitchell, still bugs you? Oh, gosh, it has to be the Indiana game uh, that we lost in the Elite Eight um, 1992. It was absolutely awful. Um, we beat them the first game of the season by 30 points in the uh, tip-off classic in Massachusetts. Um, it wasn't even a game. I mean, they were ranked number two in the country. I think we were somewhere in the bottom, you know, top of the top 20. And we went in and we just massacred them. It wasn't even a game. And we, you know, we we're on a crash course to meet in the Elite Eight. And, I, you know, we were, we were pretty sure of ourselves that, you know, this was going to be a cakewalk. We beat them by 30. And they turn around and they just slack us by 30 points. Um, and that was probably the most disappointing game uh, of my career and experience at UCLA just because um, that was a game away from the Final Four. And we felt like we had a championship caliber team that could have hung a banner that year. We had, ten, we had 10 guys on that team at some point play a minute or two in the NBA. That's unreal. It is. And some would say, looking at your UCLA career, and you, and you admitted this, that some would think it was unreal that you were able to have an eight-year NBA career and have so many years in the league. And I was listening to another podcast that you were part of, and you mentioned even that the head of NBA scouting, when you were fulfilling and done with your eligibility at UCLA, wanting to go pro, that they basically said, you got no chance of making the league and that you're not fit for this line of work. So let me ask you this, Mitchell. Why did they get it all wrong? You know, I think you don't know what ticks inside of a person. Um, you know, sometimes it may uh, register for that person later than sooner. Um, you know, obviously being a high school All-American, being considered one of the top 25 guys in the country, um, you know, you choose a school like UCLA, things are supposed to go well. Um, but when you get there, you know, you have to realize that, you know, um, if you're not choosing a school – that's going to showcase you in particular, and you're going to be a part of a group that you don't know which ingredient you're going to be. You know, are you going to be the main ingredient? Are you going to be a supporting ingredient? Are you just going to be an ingredient, an ingredient that's just tossed in? Um, and, you know, in my case, I was a supporting ingredient. I, I played every single position at UCLA. I was a man without a position. I played the one, the two, the three, the four, the five. Um, and, you know, um, things probably didn't go as I would have liked for them to have gone at UCLA, but, um, you know, nonetheless, I, you know, I think when I got my opportunity on the professional side, um, I just let it all hang out. I said, you know, I got nothing to lose. Um, and, you know, I was able to go to an organization, the Washington Bullets, um, coach head coach Wes Unsell, who was a legend within the organization. Um, saw my talent, saw my ability, uh, saw my work ethic and my, and my determination, and he rewarded me for that. And I'm extremely grateful to this day for that opportunity because 
you know, politics could have very easily have prevented me from having an MBA career, but he opened the door, you know, I came in and, and you know, really took advantage of an of a incredible opportunity. And it seemed throughout your career, Mitchell, that you never took your time for granted. Like you were always playing. And I know this sounds cliche, but it was like your last game. You always felt like you had to prove yourself every single game. And perhaps that mindset is what allowed you to be able to be in the league for so many years and then play overseas as well. And, and what was that experience like overseas? And how did that shape you as a player, but also as an agent? It, it happened for me a little later in my career. Thank, thank goodness. Um, you know, I, I went to, um, uh, to Lithuania the year after Tyus Edney was there. Tyus oh, Edney no. and his team, Ty, I was on the same team, but the year before Tyus was on that team, they won everything. They won the equivalent of the NBA championship in Europe. They won the Euro League championship. Tyus was uh, voted the MVP of, uh, of the Euro League that year, and or the Final Four, and um, he's a god to this moment. He steps in in that country and they would literally tear him apart. It's like Michael Jackson walking around. Wow. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. Because I went over to play, um, and I didn't go until halfway into the season. Uh, we played Tyus's team, and he went to Italy the following year. He was in Treviso, and we played his team, and, and, and I'd never seen anything like it. I mean, people were rocking his bus. They were cheering for him. They were standing outside his hotel, you know, and we're talking Lithuania, minus 20, minus 25 degrees, and, and they were just going nuts for him. But the experience was incredible. Um, you know, I would tell every player at some point, you know, during your career, you should go overseas and play one year. You get that college feel again, um, provinces and cities, you know, they have their own fight songs, their own colors, and, you know, um, you got the drums beating, and. Um, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. It's pretty different. Um, it's, it's nothing like the NBA. Um, the NBA is about the whole family show. Um, this is about, you know, representing your city, your town as best you can. And, um, you know, I, I had a great time over there. It, it was different, you know, because it was an underdeveloped country and, um, you know, I didn't want to have the ugly American face, so I just tried everything and, and you know, just, uh, you know, uh, took it with a grain of salt if I didn't like it. And, you know, I had a wonderful experience. Wow. So you were there and you were there for, was it one year or one season or how long were you there for? Yeah, I was there for a half, I was there for a, half a season. Um, I, I came over basically January 1 of 2000. Um, and... Uh, you know, I stayed until mid-May. So the season usually begins August of the, of the previous year. So when you then look at your whole playing career, what to this day, in whether it's overseas or I think you even mentioned playing in the CBA and playing mm -hmm. in the NBA, out of all of these years playing professionally and, and what you did when so many discounted you and thought you couldn't do it, what do you still look back and say, Man, that surprised me I did that, even to this day. Gosh, I mean, it has to be my, my rookie year, making the roster for the Washington Bullets. They had um, 16 guaranteed contracts when you were only allowed to carry 15. Uh, I remember when I, when I signed with them, a lot of people told me, oh, you're stupid, you're not going to make the roster. They've got 16 guys, you can only carry 15. It's a bad choice, it's a bad decision. And I think that's where people um, – you know, uh, and it was a lot of agents at the time. I think that's where they missed the boat on things. You know, they try to find the easy way in. And, you know, um, if you have a client that's willing to work, willing to grind, and isn't afraid of a challenge, um, you know, you drop them into that situation and you see how it works out for them. And I went in. Um, day one was tough. The second half of day one was even tougher. Um, but I got better. I got better and better with each practice. And by the time we got to the fourth, fifth practice, found the rhythm, um, started playing and competing against guys, uh, started showing that I was different athletically than anyone else on the roster. And, um, you know, it was, it was good. Um, it was really good. We had a couple of older guys on the team, so I stood out from those guys. And it just looked different. So, um, and like I said, I, I had a coach in Wes Unsell 
who was basically um, the owner's son. And, you know, he had a lot of pull within the organization. And if he felt like you deserved to stay, you were going to stay. And true to his word, he said that if you show me you belong here, I'll keep you here. I did. And he kept me there. And, you know, the rest was history. A testament to your hard work and that never give up attitude that has been such a staple of your life and your career in whatever avenue you have taken. And with that said, look, we know you have some talent in the acting game as, as well. I know you've done a few flicks. Uh, so what's stopping you from getting back into that? I know you had some fun in the 90s. And, and then how did that all come about? Because that was really kind of cool. And I'm wondering, why am I not seeing Mitchell in more more blockbuster movies these days? Well, we had uh, Sandy Bressler was a uh, UCLA alum, and uh, he was in the movie industry, and it was it was great. Uh, I graduated, you know. They contacted me and said, "Hey, you know, um, you're shooting this movie called Blue Chips. Why don't you come in and read for the role of Butch McRae?" I had never done anything like it, so I did, and, and it was pretty fun, and it was cool. Um, uh, Penny Hardaway ended up getting the role of Butch McRae, okay. um, and, uh, you know, we, I, I was in Blue Chips, and, you know, that was great, and then um, Eric LaSalle directed a movie called uh, The Goat, The Legend of Earl Manigault, uh, one of New York City's best uh, players. Uh, I did that movie with... Um, Kevin Garnett and Joe Smith and Pooh Richardson and wow. uh, Don Cheeto. Don Cheeto was the star oh, of that. Wow. And that was made for HBO. That was, a, that was a lot of fun. We filmed that in Toronto. We had a great time. And then um, I was in Space Jam. Um, I was a principal. I, had, you know, I played in a lot of the basketball scenes. None of them made it to the screen. But um, I still get residual checks from that because I was a principal, so it's pretty cool. Wow. <laughs> What's it like being on the set of one of those and having all these basketball stars around you? And is there a lot of waiting and, and, and sitting around until it's your time to get called for a scene? What is that day-to-day -day picture like when filming? Well, I'll tell you this. I, you know, if you can land a job consistently in the film industry, it's the best industry to be in. I mean, it is. It's so much fun. I mean, you've got... Uh, a masseuse on on the set. You've got all day catering, food catering on the set. You've got your own trailer on the set with the TV, VCR, the whole nine. Um, you know there is a lot of waiting around, um, but a lot of times you know guys are just you know hanging out, telling stories, um, you know bypassing the time. Um, you'd be you'd be surprised at how many days you're supposed to shoot that you actually never get to shooting because something goes wrong in production. Lighting or, you know, something that isn't right. And, you know, it ends up adding another day. We never minded because it just added another day of pay to us. But um, it took a lot longer than you would expect. Uh, but when we did Blue Chips, Blue Chips was a ton of fun. Shaq was obviously, you know, <laughs> just like he is today. I mean, the guy hasn't changed. He hasn't changed. <laughs> and I've, I've known him for 30 years. And he hasn't changed since I've known him. Uh, he's just a big, gregarious kid who just loves life. And, you know, he was the life of Blue Chips. And then, you know, when we did uh, uh, the, the movie The Goat, Pooh Richardson was on, this chair, on the set. And he's just so funny. And he was the life of the set. You know, and then when we did Space Jam, we just had everything to do because, you know, Michael Jordan had the dome built out at Warner Brothers. So, you know, we had to pick up games there. We had, I mean, it was... It was a who's who of basketball in that situation, so that was a lot of fun, too. Outside of you, Mitchell, outside of Shaq and even Pooh, who was the best actor that was a basketball player that you saw and took it probably the ser most serious on any of the movie sets you've been a part of that had some really good skill that surprised you? Hmm. Uh, I mean, I, I, I have to say Shaq. I mean, when okay. Shaq really was to get into care. I mean, he's pretty good. Uh, you know, he, he has this, this natural ability to light up a room, you know, when he comes into the room and, um, you know, he, he's, he's not bad and, he, and he's unafraid to laugh at himself, to do some crazy, silly things yeah. that, you know, most people would probably be like, oh man, some people are going to talk about me. I'm going to end up on this. I'm going to end up on that. And people are going to, 
you know, he, he's not afraid of that. So um, I'd say in all of the stuff that I've been in and I've, uh, all of the stuff I've been in and I've been associated with athletes trying to do it, he's been the most natural one to do it. Um, I've done commercials with Kobe. Um, you know, I've had a chance to do a lot of little stuff, um, but he's been the most gifted and natural one that I've seen. My final question for you here, Mitchell, is what were those commercials like with Kobe and giving us a little insight on what he was like off camera and your back and forth conversations with him? He was real cool. Um, you know, I, like you were talking about earlier, you know, he was at UCLA training and working out. I had an opportunity to work out with him on a number of different, different occasions. Um, just always soaking stuff in. Um, he was unbelievable at that. I remember when we were at UCLA, and we were training and we had all these different stations and we were working on a, on a footwork uh, station uh, post moves. And he said, Mitch, you know, look at this, man. You know, tell me, how does this look? And he was doing a move that Michael does on the baseline where he shakes his shoulders and he turns like he's going to shoot a fadeaway jumper and then he stops and he steps through and then he finishes on the other side of the basket. First time he did it, it looked good. I went over to my other session came back over, and as I was coming back over, I was watching him do it, and he looked better than Michael Jordan doing it at that wow. particular time. And I was like, wow. I said, this kid is pretty different. He's pretty special. Um, I'll tell you another great story. We were working out at Loyola Marymount, and um, Tim Gergovich, the, the you know legendary uh, trainer who was an assistant coach with UNLV's championship on teams, you know, we're, we're, it's like eight or nine pros in the gym. You know, we're all working out with Tim, and, and Tim's workouts are all is our super high level. And, you know, we're competing and we're going and Kobe walks in late. And he says, hey, kid, you know, go stretch. So Kobe goes over to the other side of the court. I got about three or four minutes of stretching, shoots a couple of times, and he comes into our drill. And we're doing this drill where you had to basically fight over a screen, defending another player coming into the post, and then the drill became live and you went one-on-one. -on -one. So Gergovich would hit you as you were trying to get over and defend the guy into the post. He catches it in the post and then you go live. Well, Kobe and Scott Padgett, you got tangled up and Kobe's the offensive guy and he comes across the screen and Scott Padgett, he's 6'8", you know, fully still uh, Tim Gergovich and he's on Kobe and he's like jamming him. And Kobe does a little thing where he flips his body forward and he puts his butt back and he just takes two hard dribbles to the basket and just turns and goes up and dunks his two hands on Scott Padgett. And I looked at Derek Martin, who was in the drill, and I said, okay, man. I said, we can hear. We're about to go here now. And wow. he just took the workout to an entirely different level. And that was him. He just, you know, when he crossed the lines, it was straight business. A never-ending thirst of learning and knowledge, and that always seems to equate to greatness. And look at you, Mitchell, giving back to the game in a big way, using all of your experience and obviously changing the lives of so many as what you do now as an agent and certainly a really important part of, important part of UCLA basketball history. Mitchell, thanks for doing this. This was a lot of fun, and hopefully we can meet sometime in person when all of this corona stuff goes away and we can get back to some basketball and some normalcy. Brian, I appreciate you having me on, and uh, keep, keep the Bruins coming, man. This yeah. is great. Thank you. Cool.